Welcome to Victoria Rumble Room, a show that endeavors to bring the issues forward from Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada, the wide, wide world, and across that planet all the way in Saanich is my co-host in crime, the Croatian sensation himself, John Jurisic. And John, there's so much drama going on right now. So much Canadian drama. Yes. You know, it, it was a while there where, well, we were able to focus on some crazy American stuff and the odd crazy European. No, it's crazy Canadian stuff. It's truckers storming through the streets, demanding the end of COVID health mandates, like really crazy Ottawa stuff going on. National conservative leader gets booted out. Excuse me. When does that happen in Canada? Kevin Falcon gets ushered through the door as the new leader of the BC Liberals. And in a few moments time, we'll be talking to a former BC Liberal MLA, Sheila Orr, who is, let's say she's not a big supporter of Kevin Falcon. She didn't support him during the race. And I think she's having a few growing pains with him as the leader. And uh, she's going to talk about the difficulty he may face in uniting this party because this party has to be united in order to win. It's the old uh, dilemma faced by social credit that moved to the BC Liberals. They're all under one tent. They can really buy for uh, party uh, unity and power. If without that, they're in big trouble. Yes. And we'll hear more about that. But uh, first, John, let's update what's going on with the truckers. It's been quite a week with the truckers, particularly in Eastern Canada. Truckers still in Ottawa, honking their horns, jamming downtown streets, shifting tactics to block bridges, including the Ambassador Bridge between Windsor, Ontario and Detroit, the busiest international link between Canada and the US. This costs big, big bucks. And the Canadian government is being pushed to scrap the requirement to have a vaccination passport to cross that US-Canada border, even though both countries have actually passed this legislation or made these rules what they are. And uh, the governments have uh, certainly had a tough time in reacting to this. It's been a little bit, well, let's let them have their democratic right. But how far does it go, John? How far does it go? Well, you know, we have a prime minister and leader who's actually become quite sick. <laughs> so, I mean, people are going, say something, say something, lead them. Justin Trudeau has is, is, is been exposed to Omicron. He's yes. been in isolation. So, But he has come out swinging lately about this truckers dispute. You know, none of us, including our prime minister, dispute that everyone has the right to protest. None of us are disputing that we're done with this. <laughs> we're done with all this health crisis stuff. But you know what? I don't think any of us, including the prime minister, agree with these anti-mandate tactics. Freedom of expression, assembly, and association are cornerstones of democracy. But Nazi symbolism, racist imagery, and desecration of war memorials are not. It is an insult to memory and truth. Hate can never be the answer. Over the past few days, Canadians were shocked and frankly disgusted by the behavior displayed by some people protesting in our nation's capital. Well, the truckers are certainly making their feelings felt. And you have to wonder, this anger response, it's going to eventually run out of steam. Do they really expect this is going to put them over the top and they're going to get exactly what they want? It seems to be a Canadian tactic right now. These, these groups, whether it's on the right or the left, you know, let's, uh, let's stay out on the street and block traffic and scream and honk our horns, or conversely, let's let's stand on the firing line and block logging trucks mm. and get a thousand people arrested. If we do these things, it's going to force government to do exactly what we want. And I just don't know that that kind of tactic works in the big picture. In the meantime, Johnny, the Freedom Convoy, it just seems like uh, it was an idea that a lot of people have jumped on board with, with a lot of different ideas and complaints and problems. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't know how this is going to uh, get resolved, but I do know, I do know that a lot of our viewers have strong feelings about us and the way we're talking about this. You know, I don't know if it's a sad testament or an appropriate testament to the way the media is, 
but the angrier the comments, the more popular your, sh your, your, your media exposure is. So let's read to our bazillion listeners a few of these me more memorable quotes from some of our viewers. For example, they are not all anti-vaxxers, please. Nobody's listening to you, Robin. Victoria is the epitome of a sleep. News is live. It doesn't need reporting. I'm becoming embarrassed for you guys. <laughs> you are definitely brainwashed. Wake up. Tell Dr. Bunny Rabbit he's wrong. Hmm. <laughs> COVID and Omicron is fake, buddy. And, and then here's a nice one. <laughs> Finally, we have to intersperse a nice comment. Thank you. These fools are rushing maskless into the shitstorm that will keep this pandemic going. So obviously we've hit a chord. <laughs> no question about it, John. No question about it. This, this show is supposed to encourage dialogue and debate. We are clearly doing that. We're presenting our opinions and our viewers certainly have the right to agree or disagree with us. I think that's what they call freedom. They're not being denied by any of us, but we stand by our opinions just the same. So we, I hope in the future, we'll, we'll keep reading our pleasant comments. So let's shift now to BC politics for a few minutes, please, Robin. Let's do that, John. And the political landscape, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, has shifted dramatically in British Columbia. Kevin Falcon won the leadership on the fifth ballot, and he's a former Surrey MLA, was a cabinet minister under Gordon Campbell. He's been out of politics for a few years. He's now back, and he's looking to reshape the party. And there's already talk in some corners of a name change. The word liberal has never sat well with conservatives who also belong to the BC Liberal Party. In fact, I know of a few conservatives who uh, worked on the last campaign that wouldn't put a BC Liberal sign on their lawn because they just didn't like the sound of the name. And uh, Kevin Falcon is considered by many as a conservative. And during his acceptance speech, he did talk a lot about the need to unify the party. The BC needs and deserves a government that believes that a private sector driven economy is the best way to generate revenues so we can fund first class public services. And that a combination of compassion and competence is the approach we need for some of the greatest challenges of our time. It's a mandate to return to a party of principles, a party of big ideas, and a party that has never been more ready for real renewal. You know, Robin, I, in my years uh, on the board of the BC Chamber of Commerce, you, you get around the province, you get to meet cabinet ministers, you get to meet politicians. I've met and I've, I've hung out with Kevin Falcon a number of times. We've had dinner together over the years. I've always found him very open-minded. I found him engaging. I found him um, really, um, you know, hoping and, and, and embracing new ideas, innovation. I really hope and think um, and expect at some point that BC Liberals who didn't support him for the leadership, come on, give him a try. You know, Chen, uh, they thought he was going to be uh, over the hill when he became prime minister. He won three majorities in a row. Give him a shot. Let's see how this all works out. Well, I think uh, there's going to be some Liberals on the fence for a while. It looks like Sheila Orr is amongst them. And Sheila Orr was the MLA for Victoria Hillside a number of years ago. She's very involved in provincial and federal politics. She is a provincial BC liberal and a federal liberal, which gives you an idea which side of the political fence she sits on. And she's not ever afraid to speak her mind. So let's zoom Sheila Orr in. And now joining us in the Victoria Rumble Room is Sheila Orr, former MLA, Victoria Hillside, a long time BC Liberal and, and actually just a Liberal in general. And she's been closely watching the BC Liberal race. And uh, we're just dying to hear what she says about Kevin Falk and the new leader. And uh, Sheila, is this, is this good news? Well, I mean, what can I say? Um, he won. Uh, and he won by a fair amount. I mean, it was the fifth round, mind you, which is a bit nail-biting. 
Um, there's a lot of unhappy people. You always get this afterwards where people stand up and say, I've been to so many conventions, I've heard it so many times. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're all going to be together. We're going to rally. We're going to do this. Well, that's kind of not true. You know, people are ticked off. A lot of people didn't think you should win. And, and you know, from, um, from a, a, a personal point of view and actually from other people that have spoken to me in the last 20, 12 hours, you know, we missed, our party missed a golden opportunity. You know, this was the first time that we could, that we were able to elect a, our first Indigenous leader ever in the country, leader. You know, this was huge. I mean, Alice Ross not only was very well respected in the Indigenous community, but, you know, he lived on the reserve. He, was, he actually was a conservative, which is quite interesting. And he was successful. And we had the opportunity to do that and to change the direction of the party. But we didn't. And, I mean, I'm sad. It was, a, it was an interesting race. A uh, couple of things I found very interesting. The other two MLAs that held seats, you know, Renee Merrifield and Michael Lee, uh, um, they actually didn't do as well at the beginning as the folk that were new in the game, mm. which is kind of like they're sitting MLAs. So the party, in my opinion, is going to go through a bit of a, I don't know, a bit of a rumble. There's a lot of people that are not happy. There's a lot of people that are happy. I mean, Kevin is a highly skilled politician he is from the gordon campbell era he was a good uh, minister of transportation uh he did all the right things he was trained in media you know that robin i mean you know it's, it's a, a, a skill set you have to have he's slick but this is another thing that really worries me how can you make the party change and build when you go to every temple in every community and sign those people up that doesn't build a party. It's great to have Indo-Canadian people in the party. Of course it is. It's great to have everybody. But to actually build your whole campaign and your race on that is not a good start. I don't think so anyway. So, but that's what they did, and they won, and that's life. And so, um, Sheila, I'd like to dig a little deeper in, into this, please. So first of all, uh, great to have a former MLA joining us on the Victoria Rumble Room a former lower Vancouver Island MLA, increasingly a relic of the past. Yeah, a relic that, for sure. I hope that changes, that we can finally maybe get, uh, um, revisit. Not, the, not that you're a relic, Sheila. You're not a relic. Yeah, no, yeah, that came out no. wrong. That was the I'm wrong just well matured. Yeah. <laughs> Aged wine. So, so near the end, and you know, we've all, all three of us have been through likely many conventions, Robin reporting, I've been involved. There's always, you know, it gets increasingly intense in that last week to 10 oh, days. Yeah. And it certainly did this time around again. In fact, one of the candidates, ex-BC uh, Chamber President Val Litwin, in fact, said he'd leave the party or something if Kevin Falcon joined. So um, you think, you, you've kind of alluded to it, but let, let's just revisit this again in the context of the fullness of time. Can Kevin Unite the party. Will he have trouble with this? He has a lot of MLAs on his side, caucus, okay. I mean. Okay. Um, can he unite it? I think it's going to be tough. Re remember, he doesn't have a seat. So somebody now has to step down. Is somebody going to do that? Well, who? <laughs> I don't think there's going to be a, a, a big uh, rush to do that. Can he unite the party? In my personal opinion, I don't think so. Whoa. I think uh, a lot of people believe that he's old star, he's old school. He's, you know, look, Gordon Campbell did a good job. I, I, I was Gordon Campbell was my my leader, but that was then. Politics have changed so much from then to now. It really has, and so um, no, I don't believe that he can. And hopefully, he'll prove me wrong. And I hope he does. You know, but Sheila, I, you're, 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 you're typified and you actually run in the past for the federal liberals, as well as being a BC liberal, yeah. a stalwart and an MLA. Mm -hmm. So you've been in both camps. We've just seen Aaron O'Toole 
moved out as the leader of the federal Tories. Yeah. It looks very much like the federal Tories are about to take a sharp turn to the right, the right of center. Um, Kevin Falcon is he's, he's in charge now of a party that's a, a joint party between liberals and conservatives. So I, I mean, do you really think he's going to try to pull the party to the right? Is he going to try to hold the two sides in place? I mean, you're a liberal. Are you nervous about having a person with Kevin's background where he was a big member of the Reform Party before he got involved really in BC politics? Is that troubling or is this still possibly going to be a uniting factor? No. Gordon Campbell did a good job of, color, of, of building a coalition. He did do that. But Gordon Campbell was neither really hardcore conservative. He was, you know, he's a little in the middle. Kevin is conservative. Kevin's people around him are conservative. They are a conservative group. How he's going to build the liberals into that, I really don't know. Is there going to be a split? There could be. And is there going to be a name change? And this, if you know, if we split this party up, you know for sure the NDP are, are, are in until the century three thousand. I mean, you know, it'll never, we'll never get in again. So I. I don't know. I've had a lot of people call me about Kevin because they know I'm not, I wasn't very happy about not making a big change. I really wanted the party to seriously change. So I've had quite a few phone calls from people telling me to rethink, rethink what he is all about. He's going to have to do an awful lot of um, good stuff to make me rethink. I I'm actually thinking, I, I give money to the party every month. The, as diehards always do, we, we give money to the party. I'm actually pulling my funding. I'm actually going to do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I really feel that uh, I feel quite strongly about the fact that we just did not make that change. And um, again, I will reiterate that you can't build a party by going to all the temples in all the communities and signing up your members like that. That does not build a party. So how is he going to do this? I mean, he had a lot of people that didn't vote for him. Yeah. I mean, he, what did he win by? 50, uh, 52%. So he still has a whole bunch of other folk, 50%, that didn't want him. Uh, so Sheila. I hope I'm wrong. I, I really do. I, I, I mean, I'm not happy the way it's gone, but I do hope I'm wrong, and I hope Kevin proves me wrong. I didn't particularly have a close working relationship with him. And what I did do with him was never very satisfactory. I had wonderful working relationships with people like, like Rich Coleman, who was very right wing, but we, but he was a balance. Mm. So, Sheila, may, I'd prove I'd me wrong, Kevin. Prove me wrong. I'd like to localize the the uh, the campaign for a moment. Both you and I know Stan Sipos. He was one of seven members running for leadership. A local developer. He entered the race quite late, therefore really unable likely to galvanize the kind of votes he needed to, to make a, a serious attempt. He had a very populist message. This whole journey is about getting things done. When I see that someone has to be shamed in old growth logging to start working on stopping old growth logging, it just brings me great pain. It made me determined. I said, okay, no one wants to do anything. I will do something about it. My feeling with everyone I've talked to, they don't want to cut old growth forests anymore. The value of old growth forests to both the ecosystem, to the health of the planet is just incalculable. And I'm bound and determined to stop this process when I become the next leader of the BC Liberal Party and after that, the premier of this province. Do you think Stan will be stay involved with the party? But more importantly, is this, was that effort by Stan potentially a launching pad for something else? Maybe mayor of Victoria, maybe local politics. What do you think? Tell us. Well, I know Stan extremely well. Okay. I mean, I introduced Stan to his wife, so I know him very well. And okay. He was very okay. Well, yeah. hi, Stan. Well, I'm sure he'll be We have a close relationship. And when Stan said he was going to do this, I thought, oh, you must be, you know, insane. However, he was determined. And yeah. you've always got to give people credit for people that go out there and run. And Robin, you know that. You know, we have to give credit to people that go and do the work. And you know how hard it is. It's, how, hard. it's really, really hard to run. It, it, it really is. You don't, unless you've done it, you don't know it. So Stan went out there and he was determined. He was determined to win. 
And you're right, his message was incredibly popular. But he only had sort of like six weeks to pull this off. Interestingly enough, Stan raised all the money in like a month. Mm. So he had a he had a network. He just didn't have the, you know, he didn't have the big network to pull this off. And uh, is he going to do something with this? Well, I do know that he feels he gained a lot of experience from this. You do learn a lot, don't you, Robin? I mean, you learn a tremendous amount about politics and that you think you knew, but you didn't. It's like a PhD in, po in, in poli sci. I mean, it really is. So Stan has learned a lot. Is he going to do anything with it? I don't know for sure. Now, would he run for Victoria mayor? Oh, I, uh, the amount of people that have said they'd get behind him if he did. I mean, he's a stew young, right? He would blow the place up. I mean, as he said, he'd kick the barn doors in, and he will. And he will. He won't say it. He will do it. But you've got Stephen Andrews running. You've got to be careful here. You don't want to split the vote. Yeah. So there's going to have to be some negotiation. Could Stan win? I think he could because he's got a huge uh, amount of following. He could raise money and uh, he's got to have a bit of a launch pad. But you've got to be very, very careful. I don't live in Victoria, but I use Victoria. And I know that there has to be a change in that city hall. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes without saying. It's 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 outrageous. I mean, I don't even I don't know about you, but I don't even go downtown anymore. I mean, I spend money. Uh, I'm in that age group where we like to go out, but we don't because it's horrible down there. Yeah. However, I don't know 100, percent and I think you'd have to really people would have to sit and talk to him and Stephen Andrews. You do not want to split that vote. What do you think? Do you think that Stephen Andrews could win? I think Stephen Andrew is certainly is, is capable of mounting a credible campaign. We don't know yet who else is going to be in the race. Um, you know, there's a lot of rumblings about people like Marianne Alto throwing her hat in. I haven't heard other names at this point. It's still early, but yeah. to, uh, you'd hate to see a, a split on the right, as you say. That's happened in the past before. We've seen that that run before, and it's not, it's never pretty if you have two strong candidates on the on the business uh, side. Uh, but Sheila, I'd, I'd, I'd like to shift it over for a moment again to uh, another old friend, uh, John Horgan. And uh, of course, we were all very concerned for John's health. Uh, we were very pleased to see him speaking on the steps of the legislature the other day. I lost a bit of weight, yeah, 25 pounds, and uh, uh, this jacket was tight on me last uh, uh, when we celebrated the, uh, the year of the ox last year. Uh, so it's nice that this fits me again. I had a, a couple of jackets taken in, uh, so I'm ready to go. He's finished his treatments. He's had cancer, and uh, you know he looked uh, he looked thin, but he didn't look terrible. And I, I'm we're all really hoping that he's going to get past all this and uh, and move to a, a healthier future. But uh, aside from that, how do you think John Horgan and the NDP are feeling right now, seeing Kevin Falcon? I mean, is this is this uh, good news? Do you think for the government? I think they're having. I think they're holding a parade. <laughs> I think that protest downtown is that parade. You know, like. That's the best thing that happened to them, to have Kevin, because, I mean, they'll just slam him on everything from the past. And um, I want to say yesterday, Shirley Bond, who, you know, I mean, Shirley's not my most favorite person, but Shirley Bond has been a good interim leader. And she did stand up yesterday on the stage and actually uh, recognize John Horrigan and the fact that he had been poorly and, and he's had cancer. And, and that was a good thing to do. And uh, you're right, Robin. He's a good guy. I mean, he's in the wrong party as far as I'm concerned, but he's a good guy and I only wish him well. And I really hope that the treatments worked. But yes, it's a good thing. I think their biggest fear was actually uh, Alice Ross winning. Mm. Um, you know, you're going up against a very well-known Indigenous leader and there's a lot of people that would have voted for him and that supported him. And Anyway, you know, these, these internal... Um, nomination races are terrible now. In the old days, you'd go to a convention, right? And you'd all talk and you'd, you, you'd exchange your votes, you'd have your delegates, you'd do it all properly. These ones, these, the, these weighted votes and these, the, the way the last two have been uh, are really bad. In my opinion, they're just really bad. And I think that that has to change. We're never going to have strong leadership unless we can get together as a family 
and seriously look at the people were who are running and talk to them and negotiate and what can you do and you know we're not doing that and I'm sad about that so this last one in my opinion was also one of those bad ones yes to your question yeah I think the NDP are probably pretty happy so Kevin Falcon apparently has some work cut out for him with uh, certain members of his uh, inner circle <laughs> who are big BC liberals but maybe have some uh, you know, feelings about Kevin Falcon that need to be resolved. So we're, we're wishing him the best. It's a tough job he's taking on. Uh, they're not, uh, they're not close to forming government right now. They've got a lot of work to do to rebuild that party and get themselves in a position where they can challenge in a couple of years. Cause John Horgan right now, I think he had the third highest personal appeal rates in the country of any premier. Oh yeah. And uh, the NDP is uh, they're motoring along. I mean, they're not a perfect party. They haven't made perfect decisions, but there's no huge groundswell to sweep them out. And I think the BC Liberals have some work ahead. And I should mention that uh, Sheila was questioning whether a Falcon could find a seat to run in. Well, after she did the interview with us, it was announced that uh, Andrew Wilkinson, the former leader, is stepping out of Vancouver, Colchina, and that's going to allow Kevin Falcon to run in a by-election in that seat. So he'll be there very soon. And again, we certainly wish him all the best with his new gig. I think Andrew Wilkinson must have been listening to our broadcast. <laughs> anyway, anyway, yeah, it seems to be working out as it should. It's tough to be a politician these days. I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. And uh, congratulations to John Horgan, uh, really, for doing such an extraordinary job in, in, uh, in Canada and certainly wishing him the best of health. Uh, um, as as time goes on. However, 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 kind of time to wrap up the show, Robin. I'm sorry. I know folks want to hear more from us, but we'll do that next week. But John, how do they how do they find us? How do they support this show? How do they become friends of the Rumble Room? How do they subscribe? Tell tell us all about it. Well, there's so many ways. And you know, even though we say this every week and we get all kinds of people listening to us, close to 300,000, oh my God. We still are very unique in that we do present our opinions and our, our, our interviews across six different platforms. We have a robust Facebook page. And, and to some degree, many of the comments that we've read earlier come from that page. And we have a, an active Twitter page, completely different dialogue, much shorter comments. We have a YouTube site that actually hosts all of our videos. And it's kind of our server inventory of of activity. We have a website that's specifically built so that our, our vodcasts transform into podcasts and mobilize on, on uh, Apple iTunes and Google podcasts, etc. And then we have our crazy uh, brothers and sisters on Instagram and TikTok. So there's no end of ways which people can hear our extraordinarily informative information. <laughs> so for now, I'm Jumping Johnny Jurassic. Oh, I've introduced a new title for myself. The Mayor of Upper Tulip. And finally, and not lastly, the Croatian Sensation. I'm Rockin' Robin Adair, and rumble on! 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 R